engaging citizens, a game changer for development. Course Summary with Mary McNeil, former team lead, Governance Global Practice, World Bank Group. Congratulations on reaching this point in the course. In this talk, I'll be summarizing the key takeaways from each module. In the next talk, Soren Giegler will summarize the takeaways from the course as a whole. Let's begin. In the first week, we introduced the concept of citizen engagement. We started by presenting a brief historical overview where we saw that citizen engagement is an ancient concept and a feature of many of the most successful societies in history, albeit implemented in different ways. We then presented the definition we used throughout this course, namely the two-way interaction between citizens and governments or the private sector that gives citizens a stake in decision-making with the objective of improving development outcomes. We closed this introductory lecture by briefly presenting several examples of how citizen engagement has improved development outcomes, but cautioned against viewing citizen engagement as a cure-all. In the second talk, presented by Alina Roca Menocal from the Overseas Development Institute, we first delineated some of the many forms citizen engagement programs can take, particularly in developing country contexts. We then asserted that, to be effective, Citizen engagement must be thought of as a dynamic and cooperative partnership between governments and citizens, rather than simply a one-way flow of information from one side to the other without significant response. This is called closing the feedback loop. We then explored the long and the short routes to accountability. We viewed elections as a very blunt and often insufficient form of citizen engagement representing the long route to accountability, and then highlighted the need for more rigorous and regular forms of engagement that involve direct interaction between citizens and service providers, which is the short route to accountability. Next, we briefly reviewed the difference between invited and induced spaces of citizen engagement, and also the ways in which citizen engagement holds both intrinsic and instrumental value. In the third talk, presented by Hélène Gravoinet from the World Bank, we reiterate the central role of context and how citizen engagement should strive to work within the grain of the existing political and social environment rather than against it. We saw that government and citizens should not be thought of as homogeneous categories, as goals and incentives can differ among players within each of these spheres. We also provided key questions to ask in order to best assess the extent to which an enabling environment exists for citizen engagement to be effective. We ended by stressing that there are no universal best practices when it comes to citizen engagement, but rather each citizen engagement initiative must be tailor-made to the local context. In the fourth talk in the first week, presented by Jonathan Fox from American University, we saw how studies of the impact of citizen engagement programs have revealed mixed results. Yet, upon closer investigation, programs that have been more strategic, that is, long-term and multifaceted, rather than tactical, that is, short-term and limited to one issue or one tool, have generally been more successful. We saw the primary reasons why tactical citizen engagement initiatives tend to fail chiefly that the mere provision of information is not enough as it doesn't sufficiently encourage collective action. Bottom-up community monitoring is not strong enough to combat corruption, and community participation in decision-making is often captured by elites. The main takeaway from this talk was that only the combination of citizen voice with government teeth or government capacity to respond can result in BITE, or citizen engagement programs that actually lead to real and lasting development outcomes. In the second week, we focus specifically on the role that citizen engagement can play in the process of policymaking. The first talk, presented by Matt Leininger 
executive director of the Deliberative Democracy Consortium, introduced the concept of thick and thin engagement. Thick engagement refers to a style of citizen engagement where citizens deliberate policy matters in a very deep and substantive way, often in small groups. Thin engagement refers to quick and simple engagements that focus on mass participation, such as petitions and surveys. We saw that both thick and thin engagement processes have their own strengths and weaknesses, and programs often work best when they combine elements of both thick and thin engagement. Jonathan's talk concluded by reviewing the primary ways in which citizen engagement can improve policymaking, namely by creating a more informed citizenry, bridging political divides through exposure to alternative viewpoints, and increasing the accountability of public officials. Tina Nabachi from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University then took us through four strategic questions regarding participation. Who should participate? How will participants interact with each other and with government? What information do participants need? And how will participation impact policymaking? We highlighted the need to address these questions in the process of designing a citizen engagement program, and then mentioned 12 tools that utilize different forms of participation to meet various engagement objectives. Next, Beth Novak from GovLab at New York University walked us through 12 practical suggestions of how to crowdsource around policymaking. The main points which came up here were the need to start with a clear objective, to crowdsource not only opinions but also ideas and data, and to make sure one provides relevant and accessible information, tangible incentives, and an implementation plan to put the results of the crowdsourcing exercise into practice. Finally, Tiago Pexoto from the World Bank explored the incentive structures that surround public participation. We first examined the efficacy of the rational choice approach in explaining why people participate and saw that a simple calculus of cost versus benefit, that is, the idea that people will only participate when the benefits of participation outweigh the costs, is often insufficient especially in light of the fact that people continue to vote in elections even though their chances of being killed by a car on the way to the polling station are more likely than casting a deciding vote. We then unpacked some of the psychological drivers of participation, such as civic duty and a sense of belonging. We finally concluded with seven tips and suggested that in order to maximize participation, not only should we strive to lower costs and increase benefits through technology, we also need to more effectively communicate these benefits, as well as enhance the psychological and social benefits that people derive from public participation. In the third module, we examined the role of citizen engagement in the delivery of public services. We first heard from Rakesh Rajani from the Open Government Partnership and now Director of Democratic Participation and Governance at the Ford Foundation, who talked chiefly about the importance of information and feedback. On information, we talked about the need for a cultural shift from secrecy to openness, and that, without information that is accurate, relevant, accessible, consistent, and disaggregated, such as information about the availability of medicines, at a local health clinic over time, citizen engagement efforts are not likely to succeed. On the subject of feedback, we saw how citizens can be an excellent source of information on how government programs are actually working on the ground. We also highlighted the risk of breeding cynicism among citizens if feedback isn't responded to in a timely or appropriate fashion. We ended with three caveats. First, we shouldn't romanticize citizen engagement, as it is not a silver bullet that will solve all governance problems. Second, we also shouldn't idealize the power of technology to fix structural problems with governance. And third, 
citizen engagement can't fundamentally resolve or alter the dis distribution of power in a given society. Next, we heard from Yamini Ayar, Director of the Accountability Initiative, who walked us through some methods and tools citizens can use to make accountability claims on the state with respect to the delivery of public services, namely right to information laws, social audits, and community monitoring. We then talked about three obstacles to participation, lack of good information, high participation costs, and co-option. We concluded this week with a video recorded specifically for this MOOC by the Tanzania-based organization Fawiza. This video gave us an insight into some of the challenges of their UEZO initiative. In the fourth and final module, we zeroed in on recent innovations in the field, particularly those brought about by the ICT revolution. Soren Giggler from the World Bank reiterated that technology is not a cure-all. Next, we saw how, by extending a March Ascend's capability approach to this domain, the ability to meaningfully use technology is much more important than the technology itself. We then went on to argue that technology should not be used just for the sake of it, but should rather be linked to clearly defined objectives. Further, we suggested that using a blended approach, which combines both tech and non-tech tools, can increase participation and inclusiveness. Next, Jean-Paul Faguet from the London School of Economics talked about decentralization and how this process of moving government functions and services from the federal to the local level can theoretically lead to governance that is more responsive to citizen needs. Shireen Madden, also from the London School of Economics, then looked at some case studies involving technology and concluded that in order to bridge the relationship between citizens and government, information flows need to be two-way as well as integrated into existing bureaucratic systems. Finally, Ashraf Awadi from iWatch Tunisia spoke from personal experience about the ways his organization is using technology to implement citizen engagement programs in Tunisia. Citizen engagement is a very broad topic. In this course, we have presented key themes that are important to improving development outcomes. We'll post information about further learning opportunities in this area and encourage you to continue to explore this subject and play a role in furthering citizen engagement in your community. Thank you.